Hello and welcome along to this edition of Football Digest Extra Time with myself, Ned Keating, joined today by Connor Bromley. Uh, it's uh, going out to you on a Thursday, so you might be expecting the usual combination of crosses and duns, but unfortunately two of them are off to Malta uh, and two of them are off to the cricket. So you start with me and Connor this week and just for a little bit of intrigue, just to keep you guessing, I won't tell you which crosses and which duns are going where, but we do have one each, so there you go, that would be a bit of intrigue. Maybe you'll see them pop up on the TV later on, who knows. Anyway, getting back to matters at hand, Connor and myself are here to look ahead to England's latest Euro 2024 qualifier, uh, a match away to Malta for England and the Three Lions, Connor. Um, but it comes three weeks after the end of the Premier League season. The majority of that squad has not played for three weeks. Probably been on holiday, probably been doing other things as well. In terms of this game at the end of what is an already long season, you know, the Champions League final didn't take place this year until June 10th. It's just another game which the players probably could do without at this stage. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. If you watched Marcus Rashford in his press conference um, yesterday, you know, all this one, he called this out, said that, you know, they're playing too many games, three games a week since November until they lost in the Europa League. The scheduling and the amount of games that these players are having to play, I know they get paid a lot of money and that'll be the thing that's thrown, but money doesn't make your body recover. And the amount of football matches that these players have played in since 2020, since the, the restarting of football in what June, July 2020 is, is ridiculous. And Having these international games, you know, the FA Cup final was 10 days, 11 days ago. You know, I mean, that was that's the end of the English domestic season. Obviously, the Man City players won the Champions League on Saturday, just gone. And, you know, I know that those City players probably, well, they won't be involved in this game, but they will be coming to join the tour. So when are they going to get a break going into next season where we head into the, the European Championships next summer where they won't get another break? It, and then after that, in 2025, you've got the reformed Club World Cup coming along, of which you'd expect Man City definitely would be in there, Man United, Arsenal. It means they're not going to get a break then, and then you go into the World Cup. So it's, it's just it's a never-ending treadmill, really, and it, it's it's cruel on the players. And I know FIFA Pro have made a lot of noise about it. Um. But I do think that something does need to change because the players are playing too many games. In terms of the competitive side for England, I don't think three weeks is is long enough probably for the players to have lost their, their edge and their sharpness. I also think the games are quite kind to England. You know, Malta and North Macedonia are hardly powerhouses of international football. In theory, we could have called up 23 players who'd never played an international game but played in the championship and premier league and they would have probably done a decent job so i don't think it's going to be any competitive issues for england though you can quote this little segment if uh, england were to lose <laughs> one of these games don't worry I've, I've bookmarked it already to bring it out on uh, either friday or monday just in case that the worst does happen for england but by the sounds of it there you're not overly concerned about the physical state then that some of the players will be again having not played for three weeks probably been away on holiday with their families so if you're not concerned about the physical state, what about the mental state? You know, how do you turn it back on again as a footballer? These guys will have rested and relaxed. They've got these two games. They'll have a few more days to rest and relax, and then they're back in for pre-season as well. You know, like these, there is there is a suggestion within football that the guys that operate at the highest level at the top end, you know, that there isn't much that separates them technically from perhaps those further down the chain. It's just what is there mentally. So the idea would be is that these guys can turn it on, turn it off when they need to. But it is hard, isn't it? You know, they've they've been in holiday mode probably since the end of the season, relaxing, unwinding. And now they've got to kind of G themselves back up a little bit for these two games before then going back into rest and relaxation mode before then winding themselves back up again for pre-season. In terms of a mental side, you know, it's... As I said there, I don't think you're overly worried about the physical state of these players, but but mentally, it's you know it's a bit of a roller coaster for them up down up down, and and perhaps they that might be the more difficult thing in this camp. Yeah, I think you're definitely right. I think mentally, the players are going to have to. You know that in your personal life, if you're at work and then you're on holiday for a week, you're back in for a few days, then you're on holiday again. If you're ever in that situation those few days you're back in, it's very hard to get yourself up to speed. And while they are footballers, they are playing a sport, I don't see why it would be any different. Are they in the same 
training mindset or they they going a hundred percent. I think fortunately those issues will probably be not not as detrimental as they could have been had we been playing nations that were more on our level comp- in, in terms of competition. So we've got lucky in that sense. I think that we are playing teams that are of a lower quality, but I do think that there's, you know, the players will be hard for them to be 100% switched on for these games. And also on top of that, the physical aspect, you know, they haven't played, some of these players might not have played, you know, towards the end of the Premier League season. It might have been winding down for them in, in some ways if they had nothing to play for in the towards the end of the campaign. There is risk of injuries, you know, if, if they've had time off and they've not necessarily been working as, you know, They've got time off. They're allowed to not be training every single day. So th- there's a concern that they could pick up little niggly injuries as well. I think th- the obstacle is mental. You know, the-, the biggest obstacle for the England players in these games is mental. It will be hot as well when they're out there playing. You know, so they will have that to contend with as well. But it, it comes back down to the level of competition. England should have no problems in these games because they're playing against teams that rank in the bottom I would venture the bottom 10, 15 teams in Europe. Uh, any Anyone listening from North Macedonia, I will uh, counter Connor's points there and, and point to the fact that they did make it to Euro 2020. They did beat Germany in qualifying for the World Cup in 2022, I believe, in Germany as well. Uh, and they did send Italy packing from the World Cup playoffs. So they have at least, you know, some... They, they, you're right in the respect that England should be professional enough to get past them on Monday. But but yeah, for anyone listening from North Macedonia, just to provide a little bit of counterbalance here, at least for them. I'm sure we're massive in North Macedonia uh, anyway, when, when I look into the stats of this podcast. But where you were saying there about little injuries that players might be picking up and, you know, in, in terms of obviously coming back and stop start and nature of all of this, I suppose is the fear for players whose futures are uncertain that little bit more, those that might be on the move this summer. I'm not saying they're going to pull out 50-50 challenges at all, but is there perhaps a a concern? I mean, I was looking at the squad and I've probably picked out about, I mean, there there could be more that move on for sure. I mean, there's there's talk about Harry Kane as well, but me being the optimistic Tottenham fan, I've left him off this list for now, but that could be remiss of me. Um, you know, you're looking at Harry Maguire, Conor Gallagher, James Madison, Calvin Phillips, Declan Rice. These are players who are all potentially on the move this summer. And again, there, where you're saying about picking up little injuries or knocks, even if it's a severe one, um, that could affect their possibilities of, of getting that move this summer as well. I'm not saying for a second that they're not going to go, you know, like I said, pull out 50-50s. But again, that, that plays on the mind a little bit as well for them. How, you know, how, how do they focus knowing that, the next time they put on an English shirt, they might be doing it from a different club or, or linking up and making their way to the England camp from a different part of the country. It, it's it's tough for them as well in this situation to, to be playing. There's no other window, I think, for England, is there? You think about it, September, October, November, there's no transfer window open then. They don't play in January. So it's tough in, in this environment as well that they have that potential distraction too about their club futures. Yeah, and I think we talk about like, leading up to cup finals. I remember when Newcastle were going to that Carabao Cup final, their form dipped because the players didn't want to get injured. And obviously this is different because we're not building up to a final, but it's similar in the fact that there's, you don't want to get injured. You know, you don't even, even if you're not looking to move, you don't want to go into pre-season with an injury. It can be, if a player picked up, say, a, a tweak, a hamstring tweak, and it knocks them out for maybe three or four weeks, that knocks them out the first part of pre-season. That can definitely hamper their progress going at the start of next season, heading into the European Championships next summer. If you start slowly, it can it can kind of snowball. So I think a lot of the players will be worried about picking up little injuries. And I think that, you know, players like Declan Rice, who is pretty certain that he's going to be moving to Arsenal, the last thing that he wants to do is, is pick up something that means that he's going to have a difficult start, you know, at his new club. You know, that's the last thing that he wants. I think players like, you know, Conor Gallagher, maybe it's not as pressing because Ch- I imagine Maurizio Pochettino probably wants to see a player like him in preseason. I don't think he's likely to leave before preseason begins. So I think for them, players who are probably, if they're going to move, will be moved on as the transfer window goes on. It's not as pressing. But for the ones who are, you know, looking at moving now, i.e. Declan Rice, I think it it definitely will be playing on their minds. And I, I also think that, you know, that's something that Gareth Southgate could have considered. Like, you know, I know Eze has been brought into the squad, but would it not have been better maybe to, to call up other players like 
Declan Rice's season finished a week ago with winning the Conference League, by calling him in for these games, you are less than the time he has to recover going into next season. And I don't think England need Declan Rice to win these two games. Obviously, he's a brilliant player. and You want him to play if you can. But would it not have been better to maybe call up some different players to give them players the rest that they need over the summer to give them an actual time off you know an actual month off to get ready for next season when you know they're going into you know a big uh, championship competition next year where they're not going to have a proper break so I do think it'll play on the players minds you know to answer your question to go full circle on that one I, it there would be insane for it not to affect the way that they're playing and you know think about oh do I want to go into that crunch and tackle when we're you know beating Malta 2-0 already in the game feel like it's already won. In terms of the starting eleven that Gareth Southgate could name, his hands, I suppose, were a little bit tied by the fact that he said that he wasn't going to give... Uh, he wasn't going to start the, the Manchester City players. Um, obviously, <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd be surprised even if we saw Jack Grealish start uh, against North Macedonia on Monday, such was his, uh, how should we put it, celebrations uh, after winning the treble. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm sure we've probably all seen the clip now involving Jack Grealish pretending to be a turkey. Um, but that's five of the squad. Again, we could argue whether or not Foden and Calvin Phillips, because they didn't play, they didn't start the Champions League final, whether or not they're as tired and, and they might be able to start against Malta should, uh, should Gareth Southgate need to or, or Fielder need to start them. But that's five players. Three other players in the squad are goalkeepers. After all the withdrawals, it's decimated down to 23. So that leaves about, you know, one of those goalkeepers will start. So we've got about 15 to pick the 10 outfielders from. We could probably give a good guess now as to who's going to start that <laughs> game. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. I think the England squad and the quality and, and, and even if North uh, Malta, sorry, knew exactly who England were going to start, that it wouldn't make the, the task any easier. But it kind of it, it kind of shows how narrow the squad is and the options that Southgate's got in terms of what you were saying there about, you know, perhaps resting some players, that he doesn't necessarily have that, especially in the Malta game, because of the circumstances in which we arrived to it. Yeah, and, and I suppose this goes back to, you know, the picking of the squad. You know, did it make sense to include the, the Manchester City players if you knew they had the... I don't know when the squad was picked, maybe... Well, they will have known the Champions League final was coming up either way. So, yeah, I, I, you could have maybe picked a slightly different um, squad. I would like to see Eze, you know, if you've called him up. It feels like it makes sense for him to, to get given a go in there, you, you would like to think. Um, outside of that, I mean, you're right. I think it is. It's difficult. I mean, is he gonna? I know we've got written here. You know, putting Trent into to midfield. Why not? You know, if that's if that's where where England see him, this is probably the time to do it. And I know we're talking at the start, and and maybe I was a little bit disrespectful towards North Macedonia, but England being the you know we're talking about a team that is getting towards the end of these competitions. I know we had a disappointing World Cup, but North Macedonia, while they have had recent success, there's still a team that England should be beating in these qualification tournaments quite easily. And, you know, that would be reflected in the odds. It reflected in, you know, what... Just looking at the two teams on paper. So I think no matter what he ends up picking from his small pool of players, England should have more than enough to, to, to get through both games. I mean, you know, do you want to, do you want to try and pick what we think the start 11 will be? I, th I think that's almost too easy, isn't it? It's going to be Pickford in goal. I think uh, maybe, maybe you know, the, the sticking point could be at, at right back if it's Trent or if it's uh, or, or Kieran Trippier. Centre halves will probably be Harry Maguire, Tyrone Mings, because obviously John Stones will be given rest, and then Luke Shaw at left back. Midfield, I think Eze's got a good chance of starting. I think it could be Henderson, Rice, and Eze, and then a front three of uh, Saka, Kane, and Rashford, um, which is still you know good enough. The, the thing with Trent uh, and uh, the point that you were making there about pushing onto midfield, and I wonder if Southgate will look at this as well, is that we've seen kind of Trent operate as more of an inverted fullback as Liverpool attack. John Stones as well being pushed on almost as an inverted centre-half, I think, is what we'd have to call him there, wouldn't we? Um, to being pushed into midfield with Manchester City. And so in that respect, is this an opportunity for, for, for Gareth to potentially you know, experiment in terms of looking at what players have done for their club sides and, and how 
you know, Pep's evolved the game tactically for Manchester City, how Klopp is involving Liverpool tactically using Alexander Arnold. Is this a chance for, for Southgate to go, oh, maybe we could look at that, how it works for England? Because if we are to say Trent as an out and out midfielder, we've seen that experiment before and it went terribly wrong, even though England walked all over Andorra at Wembley a couple of years ago. Yeah, and I, I think that the big criticism, I suppose, of Southgate, or one of them, is the fact that he's never been able to utilise Trent Alexander-Arnold in the correct way. You're talking about a player that is, you're probably talking a £100 million player. If Liverpool were ever sell him, you know, that level, top 5-10% of players, um, well, probably top 5% of players within the top teams in Europe, you know, he's... He's that good. Certainly when he was at his peak two or three years ago, amazing. But for England, he's never really found that form. And Gareth Southgate has never found the way to utilise him correctly. And I think sometimes he just hasn't used... He's called him up and just not used him. I think about the World Cup. Did, did Trent even get minutes at the World Cup? If he did, I can't remember him particularly. He didn't start a game, I don't think. So you're talking about a player that's a, a top-level player in the Premier League that England have never found a particularly strong use for. And I think that these kind of games are a perfect chance for him to to find a role within this England team. Because if you can get Trent, Trent Alexander-Arnold in form, playing a system that he likes, there isn't, you know, there's not many players better than him. He can, he's, he's passing, he's crossing, he's tenacity, he's pace. He's got all the things, all the attributes you'd want from a player. And I think Liverpool kind of figured that out this season that, you know, maybe he's not a, a traditional right back or maybe that's not going to be his best position going forward so England should try and fit him into the way that that they play and I think this is a a good opportunity to try different things which is why I come about the point where maybe I think he should have called up maybe some players who are, are on the fringes you know that maybe wouldn't be in his, his top 25 players but if they have a good season next year could go to the you know the Euros. Is there any players then in particular that you think we're unlucky to miss out? Because there's a few times that you mentioned that there is a suggestion that perhaps Southgate should not have looked at his top tier players. You're talking, you know, your Canes, your Rices, etc. Maybe giving them the summer off to look at these other players, consider them for a squad. So is there anyone in particular that you think is a little bit hard done by not to have been in this squad this time around? I don't think it's anyone who's particularly hard done by because I don't think that there's anyone who's not in the squad right now who doesn't deserve to be there. I just think that if there's players who, if you next season have a good season, so there's always players like, I don't know, like an Ollie Watkins say, and I'm not, I don't, is he in the squad? I don't think he's in the squad. He's not in the squad. So he could be one of those hard done by, because he had a tremendous finish to the end of the yeah. season with Aston Villa. That's why I was checking. I was like, did he, did he pick up an injury maybe, which is why he wasn't in the squad, but he he's an example of a player that had a really good end of the season I don't think he's ever, you know, he's not going to be better than, he's not going to take Harry Kane's place, is he? But would this have not been a chance to bring a player like Ollie Watkins, see how he, he does, see how he fits in? Because then next season, if he scores 25 goals, 20 goals, which isn't beyond the realms of possibility, then next season you would be going, well, we should take him. But then they'll go, well, maybe we shouldn't take him because he's, you know, he's not played too many games for the England setup. Who's to say he gets called up the internationals next year? Maybe he doesn't. And I think we saw that with Callum Wilson a little bit. You know, he got brought into the World Cup squad without really playing for England all that much, which made it when he came on, he didn't look like he fit in or, or knew quite where to play. And I think we've had that in the past with Jamie Vardy as well, where Vardy was in the England squad and setup, but because he wasn't given all that many minutes, whenever he came on, he didn't have the same fluidity he had at Leicester. And I think these kind of games, which England should win, are, should be an opportunity to maybe rest some of your bigger players, especially the unique situation of where these games fall. The fact that, you know, teams have only finished their season. A lot of the squad who are Man United and Man City players literally finished their season last week. And this would have been a chance to bring in other players. But that maybe I'm thinking of it too football manager in my head that, <laughs> no, Gareth Selkit wants to win the game so he calls up the best squad and you can't really blame him for that One player though that has forced his way into this squad is of course uh, Eberetje Eze uh, and Paul Connor has been bored to death I think with me this week uh, praising uh, the, the young midfielder I mean it's brilliant I, I in a previous life I used to cover 
Queen's Park Rangers. So I saw when he made his breakthrough there after impressing on loan at Wickham, he came back to QPR. And, and even in the press box there, you know, he used to get you up on your feet. You were always excited. You always, you know, you weren't sure what he was going to do next. He was a real, not maverick, um, I wouldn't say, but a kind of real exciting player just to watch because you always knew something good was perhaps on the verge of happening. Phenomenal season uh, for Crystal Palace. Again, you know, ending so brightly as well. And, and, and he's got... This opportunity now to impress for England, where other players in this position, Jude Bellingham, for example, obviously completing his move to Real Madrid this week, but missing out through injury to make sure that he is, I think he's having surgery, isn't he, to, to make sure that he's perfect for when he arrives at the Bernabeu. Um, players like Eze do have this opportunity now in this squad to, to kind of, you know, as you said there, show that when Gareth Southgate comes to picking that squad for the Euros next summer, that, that he is able to exist and live in this environment of being in the England team because for some players it, it can overall them at times when they get that first call up but but Eze has opportunity for that but looking in the shorter term is there anything that Eberche Eze can do in this international window that can convince Gareth Southgate he should be back in the squad for September of course when he gets back to Premier League action for Crystal Palace he needs to keep playing to the highest levels but is there anything that he can do in these two games that can perhaps you know suggest to Southgate that he's one that should be back in there definitely being considered for September I think it's probably a two-pronged thing really you've got the on pitch but I think also the off pitch is very important with England you you hear a lot of what the England players say and it's all about how this camaraderie the players all get along very different to the <clears throat> the golden generation of sort of 10-15 years ago where all the players were in clicks you know the Man United players didn't want to talk to the Liverpool players who didn't want to talk to the Chelsea players now there seems to be much more togetherness. And I think if Eze can fit into the England squad and the, and the way that, you know, they all treat each other and it's a seamless transition for him and he fits within that group, I think that's half of it for, for Gareth Southgate. You know, he doesn't want to have players that are you know, maybe don't quite fit into the, the culture of the team. And I think the other thing is, is obviously the on-pitch things, you know, is he overawed by the occasion or does he, is he take it by the scruff of the neck? Um, I think you'd you'd probably say that this is a a chance for Eze to showcase himself ahead of next season. Really, you know, showcase himself in the way that we're heading into a a major tournament. And if he can come in the, these games and hopefully he gets a start, I think it would be a shame if he was called up and not given, you know, the chance to to shine. It it would be a real shame if you only got ten minutes off the bench which, again, I think Southgate has been guilty of in the past of calling players up and not really giving them a fair chance. But if, if he can play, you know, contribute, not even saying score on goals or, or get assists, but just look very comfortable within the team and, and fit within the way that England play, then he, he does himself a good chance. And the thing I've noticed with him watching him for Crystal Palace is when he first came to the Premier League, he was sort of when they had like Yannick Balassi. A lot of creativity, but no real end product. And I feel like he's kind of got that nailed down now. I think he's he looks now like a player that can cause damage in every game and not just a player that looks like he could, but doesn't actually do it. And I think if he can continue that trajectory next season, um, there's no reason why he can't be in the England team because he's got unique skills. You know, he's got a very unique skill set that I think England are kind of crying out for. You know, he's a... I would say he's a little bit of an enigma, you know, when you watch him, he he, he plays in, a, in a, a very different way. And I think certainly as an option from the bench, you know, if you want to add a bit of spark into the team and you're struggling and it's nil nil or you're getting beat one nil, he feels like a good candidate for that. So I, I would really hope that he gets a chance to prove himself and, and show what he can do. Just a wider point uh, on, on this match with Malta. And of course, you know, whenever England can play, one of these uh, nations that, that are down towards the bottom of the FIFA world rankings. This is a discussion point that always comes up in that, what's the point of these games? And I don't mean it as blunt as that, but, you know, there's a suggestion that, that how qualification for these major tournaments is done should be looked at because, you know, we're arriving at this game. We, we can, you know, without getting too carried away, you know, if you were to run this in a simulation 99 times out of 100, England would win it. Again, this is a game now that is happening at a stage in the season, as we touched on earlier, that a player probably doesn't want. They'd probably rather be on a beach somewhere and who can blame them in this weather. Uh, and it's going to probably be even hotter down in Malta. Uh, I've not checked the weather report, but I'm sure Michael Fish will tell me that it is rather warm there this time of year. But on the flip side, the revenue that these games generate, this is a point that, that I feel is quite often missed in these discussions. 
you watch the game if you watch the game on Friday night you will notice that there will be a lot of England sponsors uh, around the pitch side board you know there won't be many Maltese companies doing sponsorship but it'll be the English companies that will be doing the sponsorship because they recognize that England fans will be watching it so the money that these football associations like this Malta England have played Andorra lots in recent years Liechtenstein as well when they get to play these bigger teams these are the games that, that almost set them up for you know the next year, two years, three years in terms of balancing the books. And if they were to lose them, that would be such a blow to them that you know, yes, they're not the most competitive, but we can't it it's tough to kind of say no, we should cut them because of how much it means to these nations, uh, as I said, further down the rankings in, in terms of revenue. I think it's that's it's almost arrogance of the big nations, isn't it? Like why is it that we would say and you see it, you do see it. I mean, I've almost been guilty of it in this podcast, just talking about how simple a game it should be for England. But, you know, they're a European nation and, and we're playing in a European competition. If that's who you get drawn against, that's who you get drawn against. We don't say in the FA Cup third round, if a ninth tier team plays against Tottenham, that the game should just not happen because what's the point? It's a foregone conclusion. And yes, it can be frustrating. I think it's it's sometimes not very good for football to see England beat San Marino 8-0. You know, that, that doesn't look good, and I don't think that does much for anyone. But you are correct in saying that it, it does do a lot for these nations, and also it allows them the opportunity to, at some point, become you know, produced players, and, and the money will go into the infrastructure of the team. And, you know, you, you only have to look at even, you know, Wales at times, Northern Ireland at times, Scotland at times. Those nations have had eras where they've really struggled. I'm not obviously they're not quite at the, like the bottom end, but they've struggled in the past. I mean, when I was a kid before Mark Hughes was manager of Wales, like they always just lost games. And it took them years to get to the point where they're at now where they're genuinely competitive. And I'm not saying that I expect Malta to qualify for a European championship anytime soon. But by being in these games, the revenue they get from them, I mean, this game's probably worth to the Maltese FA more than what they'd make, you know, in the rest of a regular year. And that money will be invested in the infrastructure there. So I think when the British media, us included, sort of raise those questions about, you know, well, what's the point in these games? Malta should be in there qualifying with Luxembourg to then earn the right to qualify with us. I just think we're all European nations and we all deserve the chance to be in the, the the qualifying groups. And if England get drawn against Malta and beat them 10-0, so be it. That's life. It happens. And I suppose you look as well as, uh, you know, as I said there, North Macedonia earlier qualifying for the Euros last uh, last time around. Iceland as well get into a World Cup and, and to a, a Euros as well. And these are, you know, in our, in our lifetime, people probably say that you wouldn't have expected them 10 years prior to, to doing what they did of, of getting close to it. And again, those are the kind of stories that if you were to make tweaks to because Iceland as well Iceland were really really down near the, the, the kind of uh, lower ranked nations in, in they've got a population so of like 300,000 300, people or something. <laughs> exactly as well yeah. a real fairy tale for them and they, they probably benefited again from, from playing the bigger nations and the, and the revenue that they were then able to invest in, the, in their uh, national game and, and the kind of golden generation that they produce so yeah fully, fully behind you on that one that I think to do away with them would almost be doing away with football's inclusive nature and, do you, and, do you and think what it was that's, initially created for. It's it's almost like the European Super League, isn't it? It's the same yeah. kind of premise, isn't it? You know, you're going, well, we want to play Italy, Germany, France more, so because we make more money off that, so we're just gonna take you out of it because we've done make that the Nations League. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we've got true. yeah We've got the bigger games there instead. Um, but just finally, before we go, and yes, we have tried to big up Malta and North Macedonia there, but we are about to, well, I'm about to suggest that England should be able to to, to beat them comfortably. Professional performance from England is, is what we probably expect over the next couple of games. Um, and if England are to get six points from it, just looking at the table, how it stands, um, and the fact that the top two qualify automatically uh, for Germany 2024, um, I've always had a, head, a number in my head of, of 15 points being the magic number. Uh, England are on six as we record this podcast. They could be on 12 by Monday night with two wins, 15 being a magic number. And I think that's that's probably set the bar quite high in terms of, you know, will Ukraine take points off Italy? Will Italy take points off Ukraine? Could North Macedonia do it as well? Might not even be 15 that England need to qualify. But if you were to take that as a, as a high bar, 
to be on 12 after four games, have four games remaining, needing probably just three points from him, could be a win, could be three draws, do it whatever way you fancy. That's a very, very strong position for England to be in going into those uh, final qualifiers in the autumn. Yeah, no, it is. And I think for England now that we're a long way away from 2008 where we didn't qualify for the Euros. To me, it feels like England are one of them. We're now in there with the, I know we've not won anything yet, but with the, the France's of the world, the Germany's, where there's just a, an expectation that they're going to qualify through. And I know, you know, results are earned on the pitch and the Malta game more so than North Macedonia. England should be beating Malta comfortably. North Macedonia, again, England should be winning that game com- not as comfortably, but they still should be winning the game pretty comfortably. You know, they shouldn't have to they shouldn't have to be sat defending a one goal lead for the last 10 minutes of the game. You would like to think that the quality that England have, they'd be winning both of these games and picking up the six points. I think as well, England have got so much stability with Gareth Southgate. I know there's question marks about him at the major tournaments, but in qualifying these kinds of games, you know, he's got a very, very good record. I can't remember the last time, unless it's a glaring one I'm missing, but I can't remember the last time they lost a, a game in qualifying against a team that you'd expect them to not be, you know, the, the, the record is is phenomenal in qualifying. So I think they win these two games. They're pretty much through, aren't they? And I, I think it's, if they were to lose one of these games, then maybe question marks would be raised. But those question marks will be amplified. The noise in the media, if they were to lose one of these games, would be huge. Already Southgate, you know, there was a little bit around him after the, the World Cup last year about whether or not he should continue. Um, But these games should be that comfortable. For England. Of course, a, a gentle reminder is always that England are yet to beat North Macedonia in two matches on home turf. So, uh, yeah, we, we could yet be proven wrong, but I, I agree with you. I there, really, really I need it. North Macedonia, I've been very disrespectful of them. So, I'm, I'll take don't, don't go there on holiday. They might not let you in at this rate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> also, Scott the weather in Malta, 26, 26 degrees in Malta. I did check that before. Ooh. So, there you go. Nice, so, nice and warm for the England players. Um, but on that note, we'll, we'll leave it there for now. Uh, Connor, thank you so much for joining us as always. Uh, of course, you can keep up to date with all the latest from the England camp, uh, as well as the transfer window, because of course that is now well and truly open uh, across the Daily Mirror, Daily Star and Daily Express websites. But for now, it's goodbye.